Imagine a spacecraft diving so close to the sun that it actually flies through the star's atmosphere. That's what NASA's Parker Solar Probe has done. For the first time, a human-made machine has entered the sun's outer layers, where temperatures reach hundreds of thousands of degrees. Stranger still, it's traveling through a region that is far hotter than the sun's own surface. You'd expect that the nearer you get to the ball of nuclear fire, the hotter things become. Instead, the sun flips that logic. Its visible surface is relatively modest, while the outer atmosphere is far hotter. Parker was built to fly straight into that paradox. To see what the probe has achieved, you need three pieces of the story. Why the sun's atmosphere behaves this way, why falling towards the sun is so hard, and how engineers built a spacecraft that can stare into a star and survive. Like Earth, the Sun has an atmosphere in layers. We live under the troposphere, stratosphere, and mesosphere. The Sun stacks the photosphere, chromosphere, and corona instead. We often say something is hotter than the surface of the Sun, but the photosphere isn't as extreme as you might think. Near its base, it's about 6,200 degrees C, and near the top, it drops to around 3,700 degrees C. That's fierce, but similar to the tip of a welding arc and the air around a lightning bolt on Earth can briefly reach temperatures roughly five times higher than the photosphere. Now move upward to the corona, the outermost layer of the sun's atmosphere. It begins about 2100 kilometers above the visible surface, and there the temperature climbs to around half a million degrees C, roughly 80 times hotter than the photosphere below. That upside down temperature profile is one of the biggest puzzles in solar physics. The leading suspects are tangled magnetic fields and the charged particles they fling around and Parker Solar Probe flies straight through this region, measuring both in the hope of finally explaining why the corona is so blisteringly hot. Earth orbits the sun at around one astronomical unit, roughly 150 million kilometers, and travels around 30 kilometers per second. Anything launched from the Earth inherits that sideways speed. So to drop it into a smaller orbit, you have to shed a huge amount of velocity. It already takes about 9.2 kilometers per second of delta V just to climb from the ground into Earth orbit. After that, more burns are needed to reshape the path around the sun. Engineers use a homing transfer for this, adjusting either the aphelion, the farthest point from the sun, or the perihelion, the closest point. The key equation includes the sun's gravitational perimeter, plus the starting orbit radius, and the target radius squared. Plug in the Earth's orbit, and one that reaches Mars, and you get the delta V of about 2.9 kilometers per second. For Venus, it's roughly 2.5 kilometers per second. For Parker's closest approach, just 6.2 million kilometers from the sun, the same calculation gives about 21.4 kilometers per second from Earth's orbit. That's around eight and a half times the Delta V needed to reach Venus, far beyond what any current rocket can provide on its own. Parker Solar Probe launched on the 8th of December, 2018 from Cape Canaveral on Delta IV Heavy, then the second most capable rocket in the world after Falcon Heavy. Engineers even added a special solid fuel third stage on top of the usual two, giving the spacecraft about three kilometers per second of extra Delta V. Even with that, the launcher couldn't supply roughly the 21.4 kilometers per second needed as a direct plunge towards the sun. So the mission leans on gravity assist. Each time Parker swings past Venus, it trades a little energy with the planet, loses orbital speed, and drops into a slightly tighter orbit around the sun. Because Venus is relatively low in mass, each pass only nudges the orbit. Mission planners therefore arranged seven Venus flybys. Together they draw the spacecraft into an orbit that comes about seven times closer to the sun than the previous record holder, Helios 2. Earlier mission studies explored single gravity assist at Jupiter. That path would have taken the probe roughly three times closer to the sun than any previous mission, but it created a serious power and heating problems. At Jupiter's distance, sunlight is about 25 times dimmer than near Earth, so the spacecraft would have needed very large solar panels. On the way back in, those panels would have been too big to hide behind the shield and would have been destroyed by the heat. A radioisotope power source could have avoided the solar panel issue, but it would have added mass, complexity, and cost. The chosen Venus strategy avoids those penalties and gives far more observing time. The Jupiter plan would have delivered about 100 hours in the near sun region, and just two close passes in eight years, whereas the Venus trajectory completes 24 orbits in under 150 days each, and it provides over 900 hours of data close to the sun. This near sun orbit went hand in hand with a new heat shield design. Earlier concepts imagined a tall, conical shield, the flight hardware uses a compact, flat disc that always faces the sun. At its heart is a slab of carbon foam about 11.4 centimeters thick, developed by material specialists at Ultramet. 
Under a microscope, it looks like a dark sponge, with around 97% of its volume as empty space. So heat struggles to travel through and acts as an excellent thermal insulator. Carbon also stays stable at high temperature. On both sides of that core sit layers of carbon on carbon composite. They are made by mixing graphite with organic binder, such as pitch or epoxy, and then heating the mixture until the binder turns into almost pure carbon, forming a strong heat temperature skin. Finally, the sun face inside is coated in white ceramic paint, reflecting much of the incoming radiation before it reaches the foam. The rest of the spacecraft, instruments, electronics, propellant, live strictly in the shadow cast by that disc inside the umbra. Only a few specially protected components are allowed to poke out beyond that shield. The solar probe cup is a Faraday cup, a particle detector that measures electrons and ions in the solar wind and eruptions called coronal mass ejections. A grid at its opening has a voltage applied across it. By changing that voltage, the instrument chooses which charged particles can pass. Those that get through hit a collecting plate and generate an electrical current. Near Parker's closest approaches, parts of the cup will reach about 1400 degrees C, just below the melting point of pure iron. The grid has gaps of about 100 micrometers and must both conduct well and survive the heat. Engineers chose tungsten, the metal used in incandescent light filaments at nearly 3000 degrees C, and shaped the grid by acid etching instead of cutting it with tools or lasers. Copper and aluminium wiring would melt, so their exposed conductors and housings are made from an alloy called niobium C103, about 89% niobium, 10% hafnium, and 1% titanium. Plastic insulation would vaporize, so the team used sapphire as an electrical insulator around those wires. The magnetic field instrument follows the same recipe. Its electronics could sit in the shade, while four booms made of niobium 103 extend beyond the shield to sense the sun's magnetic field. When Parker is far from the sun, it can open its main solar arrays, but close in, those panels would quickly overheat. The solution is to retract most of the array behind the heat shield during the near sun passes, and leave only the two smaller panels exposed. Water circulates through these exposed panels, carries heat away, and dumps it into the black radiators mounted on the titanium truss just behind the shield. That truss looks substantial, yet only weighs about 22.7 kilograms, roughly 50 pounds, which is very light for its size. Using so little metal, it saves mass, and limits the path along which heat can conduct from the shield into the rest of the spacecraft. To check that this hardware would cope with the real thing, engineers turned to the Adelo Solar Furnace in southern France. There, around 10,000 mirrors concentrate sunlight to a focus where temperatures can reach around 3,500 degrees C, more than twice what Parker's shield is expected to see. That heat shield and the solar probe cup were placed in that beam and blasted with the artificial sun. The cup also had to be tested while measuring charged particles, so it needed both heat and particle stream at once. Rather than bolt a particle accelerator onto the solar furnace, researchers at the University of Michigan used four powerful IMAX cinema projectors to simulate the heat while an accelerator supplied electrons and ions. Under those conditions, the solar probe cup performed even better when hot because the heat baked away contamination inside the instrument. Most of the data Parker sends home are numbers, particle counts, velocities, field strengths, and densities. Essential for scientists, but not exactly scenic. One instrument does give us images. From Earth, during a total solar eclipse, you can see the sun's corona as a pale halo, with bright loops and arcs around the dark disk. Those structures, called coronal streamers, are produced by glowing electrons following magnetic field lines, shaped by solar wind. We've seen them from the ground and from the spacecraft parked at a balance point between Earth and the sun, known as the Lagrange point. Another instrument that is at the Lagrange point is the James Webb Space Telescope. And if you wanna hear more about that, click up here for that video. Before Parker though, Every view was from afar. On its ninth close encounter, when the spacecraft dipped into the corona itself, it switched on its wide view imager. The footage looks like driving through a snowstorm at night. Bright specks racing past the probe flies through clouds of high energy particles. Those images show the structure of coronal streamers from the inside and can be matched directly with the measurements of particles and magnetic fields taken at the same time. And the mission isn't finished. The plan includes many more close passes in September 2025, it completed its 25th close pass. Each swing by the sun, the probe breaks its own records for speed and proximity and sends back another set of clues about how our local star behaves. So which part of Parker's journey fascinates you the most? The orbital trickery needed to fall towards the sun or the exotic materials that let the tungsten grids and sapphire insulated wires stare into 1400 degree blast? And if you could ride alongside the spacecraft for a single near sun pass, what would you hope to witness as it flies through the corona? Thanks for watching.